Hello all out there. Good to see that you're uh, joining us here. We will still wait a little bit until everybody is joining and then officially start. So don't be afraid you're in the wrong place. You are not. <laughs> <laughs> We're all there and you can see the title already and everything and you can see us here. So, right. We'll just wait another two minutes until official start time. Official start. Still waiting for you to join us all here and then officially start, which is in about a few seconds, but not now. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's nice to see you all. Well, summer is nearly over. The official start of autumn was on the 23rd, as we know, of September. But it's a sunny day here in Cambridge and maybe also on your end where you are. And I can see we are really, you know, looking at a lot of people joining us here today which is great and yes it's my official welcome to you all here from the Cambridge Institute of Music Therapy Research to our first um, uh, presentation in the new uh, academic year and of course it is our big big pleasure that we have Professor Annie Heidescheid who's our new director joining us and presenting on her work but before we go into that I would like you to, well, you see the four of us here. So we see Leonardo, um, who's, who's organizing this uh, for today. Then you see Annie on the screen and you see the, yeah, the presentation. And you see also Dr. Rebecca Atkinson, who's our business manager here. And yeah, our soul in, in this place. And yeah, and good to see so many familiar names. And also, yeah. I like to hand over to Leonardo to tell you a little bit about the housekeeping and how we do things while we are doing our webinars. Leonardo, over to you. Thank you, Jörg. Uh, hello, everyone. So 
Thank you all for joining us today for this webinar with Professor Annie Heide-Scheidt and hosted by the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research. And hopefully, hopefully I said that correctly, Annie, uh, your last name. Perfect. It was perfect. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So I just want to introduce you to a few um, uh, Zoom webinar features for our audience. So first, obviously, only the speakers and the panelists can share their audio and video. Attendees, please make sure to introduce yourself as, as you've already been doing in the chat, uh, where you're from, your names and your research. Um, you can use the Q&A function to ask any questions. Make sure to upvote um, any questions you really would like to hear Annie answering today, um, which will give us, you know, there'll be a Q&A uh, session at the end of the presentation. Make sure to use the social media, Twitter. Uh, in the chat, there's a, the at center and the uh, dash RU. So you can use that to, to tweet at us. Um, finally, after the webinar, there will be a link uh, to a survey for to hear your thoughts and perspectives on how it went. And also, we'll invite you to join our newsletter so you get to be up to date with more of these conferences and uh, more news about Center. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, now I'm going to hand back to Professor Jörg Fackner. Um, thank you very much, Jörg. Right, thank you, Leonardo, for this. Yes, so my name is Jörg Fochner. I'm Professor of Music Health in the Brain here at the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research, which was founded from our founding director, Professor Odell, Ellen Odell Miller, uh, in 2017, together with me. And, and we have received yeah, high national recognition with our work, resulting in the Queen's University Awards of 12. 13 staff members working on different research projects. Our vision, we want to improve health and well-being through advancing music therapy research. Our mission at Symptor is to lead internationally on the explanation of how music therapy works and how its efficacy and impact can be demonstrated to change and improve health care practice and policy. And I'm aware that you've heard that before. While I can see there's so many people really populating the chat, which is great. You know, it's great to see you all here. And yeah, and to, to be with us here to yeah, see how we try to bring our strategic aims, building research, excellence and impact, supporting outstanding researchers and exploring the social and economic and cultural impact of music therapy research into being and that you want to listen to the uh, to all the talks and especially of course now our start here with, with um, Annie's talk here today. Just the last brief thing on our official starting about the center is our five research areas are as you know healthy aging and dementia, neuroscience of music therapy, neurorehabilitation and stroke, mental health, children, young people and families. Yeah, we have uh, music therapy courses, drama therapy courses in, at the center, and we welcome all you colleagues and PhD students from around the world to listen to Annie Hardeshaw's Professor Annie Hardeshaw's presentation today. Well, Annie is a professor of music therapy and director of the Cambridge Institute for music, uh, of Music Therapy Research at Anglia Ruskin University. Prior to her arrival at AAU, she served in academic posts and has been a board certified music therapist for 12, 32 years and a licensed marriage and family therapist for 12 years in the US. She has been conducting music therapy research for nearly 25 years and has been engaged in music-based and music therapy research that has generated several millions of US dollars in research funding. She has conducted research with patients and their families in various mental health, medical and community-based settings. There is so much that I could also say also that we know each other from former work at the World Federation, Annie, and it's so great to see you here and, yeah, give you a warm welcome for your talk about music and music therapy as a resource for health and well-being. Over to you, Annie. Thank you, York. I greatly appreciate that. And I thank you, everybody, for being here. I am so 
honored to see such a, a wide variety of colleagues from around the world. Um, and I know that it's you're in very different time zones. So thank you for making time for this, whatever time of day it is where you are. Um, so Leonardo is, is managing the slide. So Leonardo, if we can go ahead and, and move to the next slide, that would be great. So York gave you a good background of who I am. Um, I think what I would simply add to, to what's already here, what you've already heard, is I've worked with a variety of clients um, across the lifespan um, in mental health, medical, and community-based settings. So I've got a wide variety of clinical experience, um, and that has also led into my research experience that is worth working with clients um, in different clinical settings as well. So we can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, some of the areas where my research has focused, you can see that listed here. I'm certainly not going to read this to you, um, but you will see in looking at this that my research base is rather wide from um, eating disorder treatment to substance use treatment to bone marrow transplant, ventilated patients, organ transplant, um, arts-based research and music therapy education and training. So it's a broad base of um, areas that I've conducted research in. So that um, is kind of lends itself to my curiosity. I'm naturally a curious person. So my research has kind of scoped lots of different areas. So we can keep going to the next slide. And I am also a collaborator by nature. So that leads me to collaborate with lots of different colleagues. And you'll see here a little smattering of the many different um, settings that I've collaborated with colleagues from, from Mayo Clinic to Yale University to Indiana University Medical School. Um, so across the board, I'm collaborating with colleagues in lots of different settings and, and doing a wide range of research. So we can go to the next slide. And in addition to doing research, I enjoy writing. And so my research and clinical work has led me to do a lot of writing. Um, I've authored lots of peer reviewed papers, book chapters, but several books. And one you'll see here is slated to come out yet here in September, which is on clinical decision making and music therapy. What's unique about this book is its focus on the therapist's clinical decision making in, in the process of working with the client. So um, I enjoy the writing, whether it's about research, whether it's about clinical work. That is another thing that I'm quite passionate about. So we can keep going as we dig in a little bit further. So here's a question I want to have you spend a little time pondering and, and kind of holding this question at the forefront um, as I present um, some different things this evening. I want you to think about, is music a nicety or is it a necessity in our lives? So I want you to just kind of ponder that question for yourself. And we're going to keep moving in the slides. So one of the things that I, I think is interesting is that music, we know that music existed in prehistoric culture. Um, what you see here is a picture of a bird bone flute. And this was excavated by archaeologists in 2009 um, from a cave in Germany. Now, this flute we know is 35,000 years old. It's the oldest musical instrument ever to be discovered. And I think the question that comes to mind for me, maybe it's the question that comes to mind for you, is why were prehistoric humans making music? When their primary task was to stay alive, to find shelter, to find food, why were they making music? Brings me back to that question, is music a nicety or is music a necessity? So we'll keep moving forward. So I think about with this, the role of music in our day-to-day -day lives. And you might think about the role of music in your day-to-day -day lives. But let's look at some data. Let's look at some data on the next few slides. Um, we spend on average 
uh, a lot of time listening to music. The general population, it's about 32 hours a week. Um, between, you know, the average music listener tends to be a little bit more, about 36 hours. People who pay for streaming platforms, even more, 39 Millennials are listening 40 hours a week. And people who are streaming via AM, FM radio, they're listening 42 hours a week. So we're listening to music a significant amount of time. That's just a little bit of data. Let's look at the next slide. Here is where we're listening to music. So you can, can see 66% um, are listening to it in the car. Um, 63% at home, 53% commuting, cooking and cleaning. I certainly fall into that category. Um, cleaning is not one of my favorite tasks to do. So I listen to music when I clean because it distracts me and motivates me. Um, but you can see one of the other times people are listening, working, studying, exercising, going to concerts and festivals and going to sleep. So we're listening to music at many different activities and at many different times um, throughout our day, lots of different activities where music is involved. So let's, let's keep going. So with all of this listening that we're doing to music, right? Music is generating revenue, billions of dollars. And if we just look at this data from 2014 up to 2020, right? You can see there's a steady increase from $14.2 billion, and in 2020, $23 billion. So there's a steady increase in the revenue of recorded music. So an interesting, another bit of data for us to look at. So we'll keep going. So one of the things that... Um, colleague even Root has, has looked at is music and musicking as a cultural immigen. So this concept of music as a resource, as a resource to improve our everyday health and well-being. Now, if we simply consider all of that data that we looked at, all of the time each week we spend listening to music, all of the different activities in which we listen to music, and the money that we spend on music, we seem to be using it rather consistently. So this brings this idea of music and musicking as a cultural imogen even closer into our possibility because we're using it this much every week. Are we using it to improve our health and well-being? I'm going to hypothesize that, yes, we are as human beings. But let's keep digging in a little bit further. Now, as human beings, we engage in music in different ways. Yes, we do listen to music, which is what a lot of that data was based on. Um, but if you are listening to music in your car, you have probably at times maybe started singing, maybe done a little drumming on your steering wheel, um, but you maybe sing and play music in other parts and other times in your life as well. Our other way of engaging is we compose music and we improvise music. So we have these four ways that we engage with music as human beings. So we can keep going. So as we consider all this time we spend with music, the ways that we engage with music, we're gonna spend a little time digging into understanding the impact of music and musicking. So we'll keep going. We know that music has a beautiful relationship and an impact on our brain. There's a lot of information on this slide. Um, so you can kind of take some time to read through this. But to me, there's so much um, valuable knowledge that we are still developing when it comes to music and the brain. But there is a lot that we know, and there's certainly a significant more um, capacity for us to learn and understand about music in the brain. But we do know that the corpus callosum, this um, tissue that connects the hemispheres of the brain, right, that is larger for those of us who regularly make music. So when we are engaged in making music, there is more communication happening between the hemispheres. 
<clears throat> we know that music is engaging our motor cortex, right? So whether we engage in movement, whether it's playing an instrument, it's engaged within that. So as we look at each of these aspects, it is not just a part of the brain. It used to be that neurologists thought that there was a music center in the brain, but we have blown that theory out of the water the more that we've been able to discover how music is experienced and um, influencing the brain, that we know that every part of the brain is activated within music and, and no other activities engage our brain the same way that music does. So it's such a beautiful relationship that music and the brain have. And again, there's still so much more to us for us to learn and discover about music and the brain. So again, something to hold on to as we consider that relationship that's there. And then when we think about it in a more broader context, and we look at not only how it influences the brain, but how it's influencing the physical body from pain to our lung capacity, to heart rate, to communication, to our immune system, to language development, to our mood, to memory, to our social skills, our community, all of this is impacted by music. So again, I'm going to bring that question back to you. Is music a nicety or a necessity? So just keep holding that question at the forefront. We can go to the next slide. Thanks. Now, so all of this has new knowledge has been coming forward. And what is interesting to see is that there are organizations like the National Institutes of Health, which is a funding agency for large research grants in the US, they have developed um, an organization called Sound Health in partnership with the Kennedy Center for the Arts. And they have set research priorities that are focused on music. And you'll see from this little diagram with these three circles, these are their research priorities. First is understanding the brain processes that are engaged with music and exploring the benefits of music on health, and then looking at how music impacts language development. Now, they've invested in this, not just identifying research priorities, but funding music and music therapy-based research. And in, in September of 2019, they awarded $20 million in research funding to studies across the United States. So that was $20 million over a five-year period. They funded these studies in late 2019, and those studies um, have been going on and are just kind of coming to their end of their time, and we're going to be seeing lots of new research data coming forward because of this partnership that's been developed and this investment in looking at music and its benefits and health and well-being and and how our brain is impacted by that. So these are really exciting things that are happening and recognizing that it isn't just music therapists, music psychologists, musicians, understanding the benefits of music, funding agencies are seeing these benefits and making investments in that. So we can go to the next slide. So currently the National Institutes of Health and research um, are looking at here funding opportunities for music-based interventions in dementia care here in the UK. So they're focused on finding non-pharmacological solutions for over nearly 885,000 people diagnosed with dementia, right? And why is that? Because there are limits to the efficacy of medications. So this is research that um, Simter has been undertaking and doing phenomenal work in and leading the forefront here in the UK. So looking at how music-based interventions decrease anxiety, decrease de depression, enhance quality of life, help patients retain speech and language, reduce the use of antipsychotic medications when we know that they have limitations, and help to minimize some of the behavioral and psychological symptoms that patients with dementia experience. So it's, again, fascinating 
inspiring to see organizations like this recognizing that music holds potential to positively impact health and well being in ways where medications might not have the efficacy we would like to see or we would wish it had. So this is just another great example. We can keep moving forward. So the National Institutes of Health in the United States has taken the step to create what, it, what they're calling a music-based intervention toolkit. And they've developed this specifically um, as a way to explore music-based interventions for brain disorders of aging. So um, I'd like to move to the next slide so we can kind of look and see what is included in their toolkit. So here's what they are really wanting researchers who are using music-based and music therapy interventions to focus on exploring. They want to understand the cognitive, emotional, sensory, motor, behavioral, and psychological impacts of music. So understanding it from all of these systems within the body and really identifying what are the music treatments, the music, music-based intervention approaches, what are the mechanistic and clinical outcomes, and what are the biomarkers that we're using to understand this. So again, this is a very exciting time to be looking at the focus on music and music therapy interventions to see how it is not only impacting every system of the body, but what are the approaches and what are the outcomes and what are, what are the biomarkers that we can see them impacting. So this is incredibly exciting to see. So we can go to the next slide. So this is the second part of their music-based intervention toolkit. And as you kind of look from this pyramid style uh, diagram, you'll see at the base of this, right, is the conceptual framework, right? Looking at the literature, what is that data that currently is there to support research moving forward? And then you can see from each of these building blocks, these are the kinds of research that they're wanting to see happen. Um, so you can kind of take a look at all of these pieces, looking at interventions, targeting populations, developing strategies, making sure we have multidisciplinary teams, means we need people collaborating. And then as we get to that next level, looking at outcomes, looking at study design, looking at recruitment retention, optimizing then as we go to the next level, optimizing interventions, looking at multiple efficacies, effectiveness trials, and then ensuring we are disseminating that research and looking at how do we implement this in various healthcare settings. So again, this is all specifically designed for music-based intervention research. This is a, from their article that was published in, in just in May. So this is very new, just kind of hot off the press. So with all of this, there is a growing interest from many disciplines exploring the use of music and music therapy to meet the complex and diverse needs of clients. And what I want to share with you is a study that um, I conducted, um, and I want to tell you a little background about this study um, before I get into the data related to this study. So we can go on to that next slide. So this is building the evidence about music intervention and, and music therapy research. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, so, yep, and again, Sound Health is this organization that was founded by the National Institutes of Health, the Kennedy Center for the Arts, supporting and driving music intervention research. So it's a very exciting development that's happening. Um, and we're seeing this in other parts of the world as well. Okay, we can keep moving forward on the slides. Uh, a great example of this is the Homeside study that, um, that Simter was involved in. Again, seeing this groundbreaking research that um, was a randomized controlled trial 
that had five countries participating, right? The first of its kind, um, which included a home-based care delivered music and reading intervention for people living with dementia. Um, so it's really exciting and you'll want to stay tuned for the, the um, primary results that are going to be published very, very soon. So um, we've got um, Simter staff working on that. So included in those publications. So stay tuned for those and we'll keep going. Then we have opportunities like Health Rhythms, which was started by um, Remo Drum. Le Remo is the leading distributors of drums in the world. And they developed a protocol called Health Rhythms. And Health Rhythms, it's an evidence-based recreational music program that really leverages group drumming to support health and well-being. And their research to date, you will see the wide array of outcomes on the other side here. Um, it's decreasing cortisol, increasing natural killer cell activity. Natural killer cells are those cells that we have in our body that attack um, cancer cells and precancer cells. So they are important. Um, they are an important response within our immune system. But they've also found that um, group empowerment drumming of health rhythms decreases burnout, um, improves mood state, improves anger control, school performance, and you can see the variety of outcomes. And this is from people coming together to drum, drumming in a group. So amazing outcomes from people engaging and actively making music together. So great things that we're seeing in that research as well. So we can keep going. So I want to tell you a little bit about when we talk about the interest in music-based interventions that's growing around the world, there are people in disciplines other than for us as music therapists or um, neuroscientists who there's this growing interest in music. And several years ago, um, when I was teaching and doing clinical work at the University of Minnesota Medical Center, I got a call one day from Dr. John Wagner, who you will see here, who was a leading cancer researcher at the Children's Hospital. And he called me one day and said, I would really like to sit down and meet. So we scheduled a meeting. I go to his office. I sit down and he says, I am afraid that I have left my patients suffering while I have been looking for a cure for cancer. And I am wondering if you can help. And I was struck in that moment that he, that had to be very difficult to come to that realization that he'd left his patient suffering. And I immediately said, yes, I can help. And so I quickly got to work. You'll see a picture of the hospital here. It's a 212 bed children's hospital um, right in the heart of Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's where the study was conducted. And the study was done with bone marrow transplant patients. And um, most people are not familiar with the bone marrow transplant process, but patients are hospitalized and confined to their room for anywhere between 30 to 45 days. So they're not leaving that hospital room. You're limited to that little space. And as a result, they experience a lot of emotional and psychosomatic or psychosomatic distress because they're isolated, as well as the myriad of physical symptoms that they experience because in this process, their immune system is basically wiped out in order to do the, the bone marrow transplant. So the challenges, the physical symptoms can further complicate or be complicated by their emotional well-being and their lack of social engagement. So while I wasn't looking at how do I cure cancer, I'm looking at how do I support their well-being in the process of their treatment. So we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so what I was striving to do was really create a patient and family-directed active music making intervention. So I conceptualized and designed this as a way to empower patients and their families to engage in making music. Now, because they're hospitalized 24 hours a day, 
for up to a month to 45 days. Um, to me, it was important to be able to give them access to being, have the opportunity to make music and not just when I could be present as a music therapist. So I embarked on creating resources that they could access via what's called the Get Well Network. And the Get Well Network is a platform. If you look at the picture here, you're going to see a screen there with these images. Um, and they can click on these images and access, for example, they could click on the restaurant and they could order their lunch, or they could click on a movie theater and watch a movie. So there's different images on this platform that they can connect on and, and have access to lots of different resources. So one of the resources that um, we gave them access to were all of these resources I created for them to utilize to be able to make music. So in order to um, facilitate this process, I needed to provide some education and support so that they could engage in making music. Not everybody is a trained musician and not everybody sees themselves as musical. And so it was important to not only provide instruments that did not require previous training, but that also uh, they could have access to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that they could engage in making music. And I could provide them with these resources and some um, information and education for them to make, make use of that. So um, this study was funded by um, our, the Hourglass Research Fund that was supported by the University of Minnesota Cancer Center. So that's the conceptualization of the study. We can go to the next slide and, and take it from there. So um, you'll see a picture of one of the instruments that's called a reverie harp. And this is a lap harp that can be played in an open tuning. It's created by luthiers in Stillwater, Minnesota. And um, so they built this, created it, and um, I had the great fortune of collaborating with them in um, putting this to use in a research study because it is an accessible instrument. Um, in addition to having the lap harp in their room, they had shakers, drums, they had song sheets, um, and I created several play along tracks that they could access on the Get Well Network. Um, they could sing along to those songs, they could play along to them, and it include, included tracks that included other drums, piano, guitar, or various rhythm instruments as well. So they had all of these tools and resources that they could make music with, they could utilize if they wanted to, and make music in a variety of ways. So we can go to the next slide. So the protocol was really designed to be patient and family directed, right? Allowing them to choose when, how long, and how often they wanted to engage in making music. So it, it was designed to empower them to make the decisions. Um, what they were asked to do as a part of the study was to complete a journal entry based on each music encounter that they had to just describe that music experience. Um, as a part of the study, I, I met with them every week to provide additional instruction, answer any questions they had. I tuned the harp and made sure that they could access all of the materials um, that had been created and were available on the Get Well Network. Um, this, it resulted in analyzing 121 journal forms from all the study participants and their family members. So let's look at a little bit more of the data. So you'll see here, these are the study participants. You can see they ranged in age from age seven to 13. You can see gender, ethnicity, diagnoses, their length of stay in the hospital. And then if you go to the far right side, you will see who were the um, other family participants that they were engaged with them as a part of the study. So it wasn't just parents, it was parents, siblings, grandparents who were all engaged and actively making music with the patient. And we can keep going into the next slide. So one of the things that I wanted to understand because there's very little very little research in working with patients and families with um, music-based interventions and music therapy. 
who are undergoing bone marrow transplant is why were they choosing to engage in actively making music? So you will see from the, um, on the far right where it says reasons for engaging in active music making, it varied. They were making music or choosing to make music for many different reasons. Sometimes it was enjoyment, relaxation, managing stress, anxiety, um, to sleep, to improve mood, to manage discomfort or manage nausea, just being curious about the instruments. Um, so there were many different reasons as to why they were engaging in making music. And this was the interesting piece to understand from their standpoint. It wasn't just one reason, but there were many reasons why they were choosing to do that. So we can go to the next slide. In analyzing the data, there were three themes that kind of emerged. Um, the first was it gave them a choice. Now, if you can imagine you are undergoing a very complicated transplant process, and it's a very lengthy process, and oftentimes, as is typical in medical care, we don't have many choices. Our choices are really removed from us at that point. But with a music intervention, they could make decisions. They could choose when, why, and how long they wanted to engage in music. They could choose why they wanted to use it and the different ways that they could choose to use music. It gave them choice. The other theme that emerged is that they discovered I could use music as a resource. And music was accessible to me because of the, all the resources and the instruments. They were discovering their own ability to make music and that they could use it as a means to cope with what they were experiencing. They also felt a sense of empowerment. So they had it offered them a sense of agency to be able to act, to do something, and to exert control. And those were the important themes that emerged from what they were sharing in their journal entries. I'll share an example with you. I um, came to the hospital one day to meet with um, a, a father and his son who were participating in the study. Um, Jose and Miguel not their real names because they were changed for this for this uh, sake of this presentation. They had traveled to the University Children's Hospital from South America so Miguel could undergo a bone marrow transplant. So they've traveled a long distance. They came for this very specialized treatment and, and it was just Jose and Miguel who were there. The rest of their family was still in South America. Um, when I approached them initially about the study, Jose said, I I'm not musical, but I guess I'd be willing to give it a try. So they agreed to be a part of the study. And during one of those weekly visits, Jose shared with me, um, Miguel was having a really difficult morning. He was experiencing discomfort. He was very irritable. He said, everything I tried, nothing seemed to work. I didn't know what to do. I was feeling so frustrated. But he said, in my moment of desperation, I grabbed the harp and I started to play. And he said to me, he fell asleep. And I kept playing. And as I continued to play, I realized that I needed that music as much as my son did. And I was very touched by his simply coming to the music out of desperation, but leaning into it and finding how it provided not only comfort for his son, but comfort for himself. We can go to the next slide. So the next study that I want to talk about is moving into a different area, but it's working with mechanically ventilated patients. And these are often times where we're dealing with very complex symptoms. Um, what I want to talk about today is specifically using patient-directed music listening to decrease delirium. So we can go to the next slide. So delirium is a serious change in one's mental abilities, and it can result in, in a lot of different um, difficult 
changes, a, con a sense of confused thinking, a lack of awareness of our surroundings. It can cause or worsen dementia. And if delirium um, develops or progresses, it has negative impacts on our health outcomes, and it actually puts us at an increased risk for death. So currently there is no pharmacological treatment that, that effectively treats delirium. There's just no effective treatment currently. Um, what we do know is that patients who are 65 and older are at an increased risk for developing delirium when they're hospitalized, and especially when they're mechanically ventilated. So we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> oh, we can, we can move past that one. That one's, oh, we've got some things out of order here. Okay, let's see. Can you mm, keep, keep going? Oh, oh, can you go back just a smidge there? Go back one. Here we go. Oh, yep, that one. There we go, right there. We've got some, I've got some slides out of order here. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about this study. So this study working with um, patients with delirium, this is a five-year study. Um, earlier, I talked about the Sound Health Initiative um, that they funded several studies across the United States that $20 million that was set aside and, and awarded in 2019. This study was one of those 19 studies that is funded. And this is a study that I'm working on with colleagues from the um, Indiana University Medical School with um, and faculty from um, Mayo Clinic as well. So this study is still underway, but we are um, funded through the NIH's Sound Initiative. Um, we're still enrolling participants in Minnesota and Indiana. And we are using a patient-directed music listening protocol to decrease delirium in mechanically ventilated patients. So we did a pilot study. Now we're using this funding to do a randomized controlled trial and looking at music's effectiveness in managing delirium, managing and decreasing delirium. So you will have to stay tuned for these study results. You can look at the results from the um, uh, feasibility study that we did that had a positive impact. So that led us to move forward with this particular study. So you will see um, the results coming forward of this one in the near future. Um, as we wrap up this study and we look at further research. Um, but again, the key piece to me in this process is how we're using music to really deal with very difficult, complex, and persistent symptoms that we don't have medication that's effective for. So music is proving to be a valuable tool and resource to treat this. Okay, Leonardo, we're going to have to go back a little bit. <clears throat> Okay, um, go back one more, I think. There we go, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I wanna try to get through one more study and then um, we're gonna be doing some Q&A time. So this last one is really looking at addressing underlying mental health issues. This is a feasibility study um, using the Bonnie method of guided imagery and music with clients and eating disorder treatment. So let's go to the next slide and I can tell you a little bit more about this study. So the rationale for this study um, are really the complex nature of eating disorders and their clients with eating disorders have a lot of comorbid health diagnoses, mental health diagnoses, as well as medical complications that impact every system of their body. So when clients are diagnosed with an eating disorder, there's often prolonged as well as multiple treatment episodes. And what adds to the complexity of the eating disorders is there's multiple risk factors and etiologies. So not just one cause for why does somebody get an eating disorder. Now, the data is also showing us that in 2020, there was a 66% increase in hospital admissions for clients with eating disorders. So now we mitigate that with, if you look at this last piece of information, it's estimated that eating disorder treatment is effective for about 50% of clients. That is not great information, but that's what the research is telling us. We can go to the next slide. 
So um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm trained in the Bonnie method of guided imagery and music. For those who might not be familiar with it, it's a music psychotherapy approach. And we focus on using music to uncover unresolved and unexpressed experiences and emotions. So we're using specifically selected and programmed music to be able to do that. And in the process of listening to the music, the client and the therapist are engaging in an active dialogue. The client is describing what they're experiencing. And, and as the therapist, I'm asking them questions and I'm providing guiding to kind of deepen their experience within the music and to explore the images and the music a bit more. Um, so that's a little bit of information about GIM. We can, we can go to that next slide. So the conceptual framework for this study is really recognizing that there are issues underlying um, the diagnosis of an eating disorder. That might be trauma, that might be relationship issues, unresolved emotions or unhealthy coping strategies. Um, oftentimes in eating disorder treatment, what treatment is focused on is, is reducing symptom use. So getting clients to stop purging or over-exercising or restricting food. So it's managing symptoms and not necessarily addressing the underlying issues. So my focus was really using GIM to help resolve the underlying issues to then support healthy coping and helping clients then being able, helping them to manage their life issues. So using this to not only support their treatment, but their recovery process as well. So this is the conceptual framework that underlied this study. We can go to the next slide. So the participants in this um, feasibility study were eight females. You can see the age range. Um, eating disorders impact individuals all the way from in under 10 to I've worked with clients all the way into their 70s. And so oftentimes people think of eating disorders as uh, a disorder for teenage girls, but you can even see from this study the wide age range. Um, it included participants that had various eating disorder diagnoses, many um, comorbid mental health diagnoses. They'd been living with their eating disorder an average of 15 years. So they were really complex cases, um, had a mean of eight previous treatment episodes, and they were engaged in different levels of eating disorder treatment. So we can go to the next slide. So this is just an overview of the study participants. You can again see the age, you can see their eating disorder diagnoses, but then you can also see their comorbid mental health diagnoses. Um, again, you can see that for some of them they had several. So again, adding to the complexity of the case. And then you can also see over on the right how many previous treatment um, episodes they had been involved with. So anywhere from one to 13. So lots of treatment for some overall. So this was a feasibility study really exploring the process of integrating GIM into usual eating disorder treatment, exploring participants' perceived benefits. What did they see as beneficial? Looking at what challenges they saw in integrating GIM into treatment. Um, as a part of the study, they received one GIM session a week. And overall, they rated um, GIM on, it's a, on a one to, one to seven Likert scale. Um, on average, they rated it as a 6.5, so very helpful. Um, and their scores ranged from five to seven overall. So we can go to the next slide. So the study lasted for 12 months. Overall, between the eight participants, they received 116 GIM sessions, which was an average of 14 and a half sessions. Um, and so they received anywhere from either 11 to seven sessions based on their time in treatment. So we can go to the next slide. And in looking at what they identified as their, uh, the benefits to GIM, there were three themes that emerged from their data. Um, the first was helping them develop insights 
And you can see the sub themes from there. It helped them find their inner resources, connecting with their courage, discovering their resilience and experiencing that sense of empowerment. And then it was emotional processes. So identifying their emotions, exploring emotions and working through unresolved emotions. And the third theme was fostering support and growth. And they recognized they were able to utilize their own inner resources, begin to see themselves as capable, envision life without the eating disorder, and feeling more comfortable with their changing self. So this is what they identified as what they found beneficial from the GIM sessions. We can go to the next slide. And that one we can move past. And we can keep going. So in kind of bringing this all back, now as we think about music-based interventions and music therapy research, we are seeing that these are effectively treating a myriad of symptoms that help to improve health outcomes in patients. They help to uncover and address underlying issues that support recovery. And it supports engagement in music making that fosters our well being. So we come back to this idea of music as a cultural imogen, music and music making being a way, uh, serving as a resource for our health and well being. So let's go to that next slide. So I posed this question earlier, is music a nicety or a necessity? I'm not gonna answer the question for you. We might all have different answers to this question, but something I want you just to consider based on what you know already, what you have taken in this evening, and just considering, is music a nicety or a necessity? We can go to the next slide. So I think I've run a little bit longer than I had wanted to, but now we've got some time for some Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you, Annie. That was great. Thank you to hear and to listen, to see all that huge amount of work that you were presenting and uh, what you have done. Um, yes, we have a few questions in the Q&A section. Maybe just, just allow me a short one. The mm -hmm. Get Well Network, was that like an online network in the hospital where, the, where from outside the, uh, the relatives were able to join? Or was there, were, were they able to come in to play with the people? But there's maybe some, some problems related to it. Can you just briefly say something about that? Abs yeah, absolutely. So the Get Well Network is a platform that, that's used internally within the hospital. So it's, um, it's utilized for patient um, it can be utilized for patient care. Patients can get information about their medications. They can order their food. They can, they can get various resources. So the patients and families involved in the study were the patients and fam were the, were the family members who could come and visit. So parents could be there, siblings could be there, grandparents could be there. Patients were not allowed to leave their room. So they had to be there 24 seven, but family members could come and visit and family members came in. And as you could see from who was engaging in making music, it was parents, siblings, grandparents, which is really exciting. They accessed um, the play along tracks via the Get Well Network. Um, so they didn't, they didn't engage in music making with each other through the Get Well Network. They did that in real time and in, in the real moments, um, face to face, yep, in patient rooms. That's a great thank question. You. Thank you, just to, because it links somehow to the next question, which we have in our Q and A uh, section. But um, so thanks for the fantastic talk, Annie. I'm conducting a pilot study using online music, online therapies to let music therapy. Do you have any experience or views of music therapy research using online methods? Somehow, this is why I kind of pose my question first. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I haven't done online therapy. I haven't done research there. I have done 
telehealth music therapy as a clinician, but I haven't done research around that yet. But, um, uh, well, let, let me let me take that back. I did I did a study. We did a telehealth study with our students engaged in it um, while I led telehealth. So the research that I have done around that has been engaging students in telehealth music therapy sessions. So, um, but not research with clients and doing that. Right. Thank you. Um, mm. Then we have one question about PhD studies applying music therapy and current possibilities. I think, Alina, you better get in touch with us straight uh, <laughs> because we, we cannot just answer right now here and that. But the next question, thank you, actually, Evelyn, that we're posing the first question, uh, putting another first question, sorry. Uh, Nick Kotz is in a world where the arts outside of therapy is increasingly recognized as having an important role to play in health and wellness what role do you see for musicians and music-based organizations to contribute to future practice and research oh. healthcare yeah yeah absolutely i think i think there's great possibility um i've i've collaborated with musicians i've collaborated with lots of other disciplines and research um i i think there's great opportunity i think it's how we um, rely on each other's knowledge and expertise to provide the best um, intervention for patients and families. Um, I know that, you know, where my area of expertise is as a music therapist, I know patients, I know their processes of treatment, um, how they might be responding to symptoms, which are things a musician wouldn't necessarily have that knowledge, but they have other knowledge, which we can certainly make use of. So I think as we look at ways in which we come together and collaborate, I think is really important. And again, all of that is really to ensure that we are designing something that is of best use and supports the patient and doesn't, doesn't harm or um, put the patient at risk in any way. So I think there's a lot of potential and possibility for collaboration. And given where we're seeing music intervention-based research and music therapy research going, I think we're going to continue to see more and more opportunities for that research to happen and the ways that we make it accessible to people in the community in clinical-based settings. So I, I think there's going to be great growth and opportunity in, in all of those areas. Thank you, Annie. And you've seen maybe some more questions that have popped up in the in the chat already. Um, I wonder which one we're going to go for. So the the role of the music therapist in GM, I mean, that's a quite 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 extensive question to to answer. But maybe how do you how does the therapist formulate the structure of these GM sessions? Do you want to answer that or? Yes. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. Let me get, let me so, give a quick answer to that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. it's very um, the GIM session is is a I will say it's a very structured session, um, simply because you know when a client comes in we we need to kind of do a check in we need to see how they're doing, um, and that because that's helping us identify what is the music that we might utilize within that session. But then we have to prepare them for moving into the music. So we're kind of guiding that process. And then um, how we guide them in the process is very reflexive because we have to respond to them moment to moment to moment. And then as we bring that session to an end, we process and we work on the integration part of that session as well. So it's a very active role in that process, but it's also holding it very structured for the patient as well. So that's a really important part in that of how structured that is. I'm certainly happy to talk more about that. Um, if you want to contact me and know more kind of more specifics about that process too. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more questions here, but of course we have, it's 1830 already. So some of you may need to go, may want to leave, but I I'm inclined to go on a little bit like two minutes to to see how we can go on with some of the questions. So I wonder if, Annie, have you picked one up particularly or uh, seen one? I mean, we could go step by step. Um, so, but uh, I'd like to take one from Andrew right now. With your work and research, are you convincing other health and social care professionals that music therapy is a necessity? 
That's I, Andrew's from Bumped. I that's a that is a great question, I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a very clear example of this, and I, and I'm gonna say yes. And um, my example of this is one of the ICU doctors that I conduct research with. He, um, this was a few years ago when I was, um, we've been working on, we did the pilot study and now we're working on the delirium randomized controlled trial. And again, he's, he's an ICU doctor. Um, and he said to me, Annie, I really think that what would benefit our patients is if we had a musical ICU. An ICU where music was a part of every step of their treatment and their care. Now, I'm looking at him thinking, that's probably what I should be saying as the music therapist. But this was coming from the medical director of the ICU. So, yes, I do believe that people, and, and not simply because we're convincing them because the research is convincing them because they see the limitations that medication holds. And I'm, and I'm not advocating for, we get rid of medication, but they're seeing where the limitations of medication lie and they're seeing the potential in music. Thank you, Annie. I think this is nearly a nice, you know, wrapping up and uh, answering to your question that you were posing uh, with a necessity and, and, and nicety and necessity. <laughs> and yes, the colleagues, Helen, uh, and, and also, you know, Kate and, and Naomi, maybe you forgive me if I'm not coming back to your questions uh, right now, just given the time and the fact that we want to say something about the next lecture, which is coming up quite soon. So over to you, maybe, um, Leonardo on that you know if you want to say something sure. here thank you so much Annie this was a fascinating lecture on the growth of the potential for music therapy and I want to thank everyone for attending today we were over a hundred at some point and um, it was great to see you all here once you leave it would be amazing if you can uh, sign and uh, fill in the feedback form be very useful for our uh, conferences so next uh, week actually the 2nd of October we have mm. uh, Dr. John Stuart Reed uh, doing a lecture uh, called sound therapy and music medicine all the biological mechanisms uh, it'll be very interesting it'll be very interesting <laughs> um, so all about you know, energy fields and quantum uh, stuff who sounds like big words but I'm sure it'll be very interesting um, we had people attending all from Cambridge, London, Portsmouth, Bristol, the USA, Edinburgh, Symington, Scotland, South Wales, India, Hertfordshire, Dunfermline, Norwich, Slovenia, and Philippines. That was wow. quiet. <laughs> so it was, it was very great to see you. So um, thank you. That's that's all from me. Thank you again, Annie, for presenting. And uh, Absolutely. it was great to see you. There was one from Jamie that I, and I think with the talk in the next week, maybe if Jamie is, is joining us there, maybe then we come back to this question. So we will save all that, what you have sent to us. And yeah, it's an ongoing process. And we really looking forward to see you next week or in one of our next uh, events that we offer to you for free and yeah, for the sake of the profession. Okay, thank you so much, Annie, and all joining and sorry if I had to uh, stop it here at this point. Thank you. Thank All you right. So bye bye. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Please join the newsletter. It will be very important. <laughs> yes. Join the newsletter. And then you know what's coming up next and so on. Right. Exactly. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you both. Yep. Thanks so much. Oh, did we lose Leonardo already? No, no. We're oh, still there. There you are. Yeah, Thank yeah. you for navigating. Well done, Thanks. Annie. That was brilliant. Really, really, really great. I'm oh, sorry that your slides you. got mixed up. Oh, it's all oh. right. It's all right. All worked out. Yeah.